So are, are we all ready to start? Varmt välkomna, jag får be er att ta era platser. Please take your seats, we are ready to start. Please take your seats. We have a very tight schedule, but we also have a reception afterwards. So if you have the feeling you are not fed enough or you need some more to drink, be patient. You will be rewarded afterwards. So, tack så om ni kan ta era platser. Mottagningen kommer att fortsätta efteråt. Vi har ett väldigt tight schema så vi behöver sätta igång. While you take your seats, please make sure that the interpretation equipment is working. There will be interpretation to French, it's channel one, to German, it's channel two, to Swedish, channel three, to Italian, channel four, to English, channel five. So there will be people speaking all these languages on stage. So please, those of you who speak Swedish and English, you still might need your headphones. Yes? So even ni som pratar både svenska och kanske engelska och kanske till och med tyska, det kommer också att prata spanska på scen. Så se till att ni har er tolkningsutrustning på er. And there will be translation to Spanish and channel six. Perfect. We will start with a short video. Vi kommer att börja med att titta på en liten film tillsammans. Är vi redo för den? Någon som fortfarande dröjer kvar, jag tror det. Varsågoda. Every day in Europe, we try to build decent lives for ourselves. We try to make ends meet. Working day and night. Or taking endless unpaid internships. Sometimes, we're faced with difficult choices. Sometimes, we don't have a choice. Some of us had a job, but can't afford the weekly shop anymore. And we always need to be faster. But are we covered if things go wrong?
Could things be different? We want a chance to rebuild our lives. To provide good food for our children every day. And to have parental leave when we need it. We want the right to stable working hours and fair pay. We should earn decent salaries, be paid for our skills, and should all be covered with basic health insurance. We want dignity, equality, and protection for all. Varmt välkomna hit ikväll, Lisa Pelling heter jag. Jag är normalt sett utredningschef på den fackföreningsnära tankesmedjan Arena Idé. Men ikväll så är jag er moderator. Det här mötet är tänkt att vara ett möte där ni som är här i rummet just nu och alla ni som följer på Twitter, som följer livesändningen ska kunna delta med era åsikter, med era visioner, med er kritik, med er ilska, med ert engagemang. Så det är en möjlighet här ikväll och den följs också av fler möjligheter. För det här mötet är en serie möten. En serie möten som har kommit till i en tid där ett av EUs länder har röstat om att lämna unionen. En tid där vi ser ökande främlingsfientlighet, ja faktiskt ökande nationalism, spänningar både inom EUs länder och mellan EUs länder. Och då är det gamla slitna uttrycket att, som Jacques Delors ut- yttrade att om EU inte fortsätter att trampa, EU är som en cykel, fortsätter vi inte att trampa så kommer vi att falla. Så är det uttrycket kanske mer relevant än någonsin tidigare. Så vi träffas här ikväll för att försöka trampa vidare. Åt vilket håll ska vi? Kan vi hitta en ny färdriktning? Kan vi få upp hastigheten på det europeiska projektet igen? Och vad ska i så fall vara de vägledande principerna? Vad ska vara våra värderingar? Det kommer att finnas en rad berömda, storartade personligheter här på scenen. De har kommit hit för er skull. Det är november i Göteborg, de har inte kommit hit för vädret Utan de är här för er Och tanken är att ni ska ha möjlighet att lyssna på dem Men också ställa dem till svars Ställa frågor, interagera, debattera, diskutera Och alla ni som följer livesändningen Ta chansen att också göra det på nätet Ni som sitter här i salen Stäng gärna av era mobiltelefoners ljud men håll mobiltelefonen i handen och delta i den digitala debatten. Vi har två hashtags som vi rekommenderar ikväll. Dels såklart Europe Together, hashtag Europe Together Europa tillsammans. Och dels hashtag Social Summit 17, så Social Summit 17, så att ni kan delta i debatten också digitalt. De som ska prata här uppe har fått stränga order om att vara extremt kortfattade. Så om ni tycker att de låter ganska kortfattade så är det för att jag har varit väldigt sträng. Och jag har sagt att de ska prata som att deras politiska liv hängde på att de kunde sammanfatta sitt politiska budskap på ungefär en minut. Möjligen två minuter i de paneler där vi är lite mer generösa. Och så är det några av talarna som har fått några minuter till. Men så att ni vet det också. Innan. Det är inga problem att prata fort. Det är fantastiska tolkar som sitter här i båsen bakom oss. Men vi måste alla prata i mikrofon. För annars så hör de inte in i båsen och kan inte hjälpa oss med tolkningen. Så att prata fort är inget problem men gärna alla måste prata i mikrofonen. 
Vad blir resultatet av ett sånt här möte? Det är väl den frågan som man ständigt ställer sig när vi träffas på europeisk nivå. Leder det någonstans? Blir det någonting? Ja, vi hoppas det. Rent konkret så hoppas vi att det här mötet ska kunna enas om ett uttalande. Det här uttalandet har funnits på nätet i tre veckor och har redan fått en massa kommentarer, synpunkter, förslag som har arbetats, arbetats in i uttalandet. Den version som har resulterat efter de här eh, kommentarerna, synpunkter från europeiska medborgare överallt på vår kontinent, den ligger i era foldrar. Så ta gärna fram uttalandet och se vad ni tycker som sitter här idag och alla ni som följer livesändningen. Motsvara det här uttalandet, vad ni skulle vilja se för ett budskap från Göteborg här eh, ikväll. Twittra det, kommentera det, ta upp det era frågor och synpunkter under mötet. Så att när vi lämnar här ikväll så har det dokumentet blivit ytterligare lite rikare och ytterligare lite närmare än dokument som visar den färdriktning som vi skulle vilja ta efter mötet. Nu ska jag lämna över ordet för att säga några välkomstord. Först till vår värld, ordförande för Socialdemokraterna i Europaparlamentet, det progressiva förbundet av socialdemokrater och demokrater, Gianni Pitella. Välkommen hit. Dear friends, uh, I'm very happy to be here and I want to, to thank you for this meeting and uh, I want to thank uh, to Anne-Sophie Hermanson, the mayor of Göteborg, this splendid city, although the weather. And I would like to thank the Swedish delegation and its uh, head of the delegation, Marita. And all the colleagues here e vorrei svolgere passo all'italiano la mia lingua madre vorrei svolgere qualche veloce riflessione partendo da, da una considerazione negli ultimi anni spesso avete sentito parlare abbiamo sentito parlare di fine del lavoro ma il lavoro resta il pilastro delle nostre economie, della nostra società. In Europa oggi più di 230 milioni di uomini e di donne lavorano e la ricchezza del nostro continente è l'impegno quotidiano delle lavoratrici e dei lavoratori, la loro creatività. Una forza progressista come la forza socialista europea non può che richiamarsi innanzitutto al lavoro, la radice del socialismo è il lavoro. E questo è ancora più vero in tempi di grandi cambiamenti come i tempi attuali. Il lavoro è cambiato, la società è cambiata. Nello spazio di una generazione il cittadino europeo medio è passato dall'avere un lavoro per tutta la vita ad avere ora dieci lavori nel corso della sua vita e 16 milioni di persone lavorano e vivono in un paese diverso da quello di origine la nostra società invecchia e gli abitanti si concentrano sempre di più nelle città questi cambiamenti aprono grandi opportunità ma rendono le nostre società più vulnerabili. Oggi l'Europa è, è attraversata da fratture sociali profonde. Come spesso ci ripetiamo, anche lo abbiamo detto anche a Bruxelles, nel nostro grande evento di Together a Bruxelles, ci sono fratture perché la globalizzazione ha creato vincenti ma anche perdenti e ha eroso antiche solidarietà, giovani, donne, bambini europei poco istruiti e nuove aree periferiche sono i dimenticati, i trascurati, i perdenti della globalizzazione. 
perciò serve una nuova agenda sociale per l'Europa che deve parlare innanzitutto a queste persone e il summit di Gothenburg ha il merito di rimettere queste questioni al centro dell'agenda politica la dichiarazione sul pilastro dei diritti sociali sancisce per la prima volta una base comune per garantire che ovunque in Europa siano assicurati i diritti sociali e questa conquista cari amiche e cari amici care compagne e cari compagni e lo dico anche a coloro che ci seguono su web questa conquista è la conquista del gruppo dei socialisti e dei democratici al Parlamento europeo non si sarebbe avuta questa conquista senza l'azione dei nostri compagni e delle nostre compagne nel Parlamento europeo certo non basta perché la dichiarazione è una dichiarazione per quanto solenne possa essere però è il primo passo fino agli ultimi mesi o agli ultimi due anni si parlava di banche si parlava di salvare le banche di finanze chi parlava di questioni sociali chi parlava di questioni sociali siamo stati noi a porre il tema della centralità della questione sociale nell'agenda politica sono stati i nostri ministri che saluto sia le ministre svedesi sia il nostro carissimo amico Nicola Smith, così come saluti i vicepresidenti del gruppo e i compagni impegnati in Solidar nel Comitato delle Regioni, nel Comitato Economico e Sociale, tutte voi e tutti voi. Così come ringrazio Maria Gioao per il grande lavoro svolto quando abbiamo approvato nel Parlamento europeo il rapporto sul pilastro sociale. Dobbiamo essere fieri di questo risultato e dobbiamo chiedere che questo testo, sono convinto che il, il vicepresidente sulle questioni sociali, il compagno Udo Bullman, condividerà questo, questa tesi, che questo testo sia trasformato nel protocollo sociale che da tempo richiediamo e che deve avere lo stesso valore dei trattati quindi non una mera dichiarazione ma un testo che abbia un valore giuridico come quello dei trattati su queste basi possiamo produrre risultati concreti i cui effetti siano visibili a tutti i cittadini il presidente Juncker nel suo bel discorso che ha fatto nel Parlamento europeo a proposito dello Stato dell'Unione ci ha fatto anche alcune promesse che noi non dimentichiamo una promessa è stata la creazione di un'autorità europea del lavoro e l'istituzione di un numero individuale di sicurezza sociale valido in tutta Europa per garantire la trasparenza e la portabilità dei diritti tra un paese e l'altro si sta impegnando tantissimo Agnes sul tema dei diritti dei lavoratori trasfrontalieri quelli che lavorano fuori e sul principio stesso salario per, stesso, per lo stesso lavoro nella, nella stessa area e non si scherza su queste cose per noi sono cose serie perché non si scherza sui diritti dei lavoratori e ora vorrei aggiungere con, andando verso la conclusione del mio intervento un pensiero speciale per i bambini per i bambini sì la vita di ognuno si, di noi si gioca nei primi anni di nascita e le principali diseguaglianze si concentrano nell'infanzia oggi un bambino che nasce da una coppia con un basso livello di istruzione ha probabilità molto alte di avere un tenore di vita inferiore a quello di un suo coetaneo nato da una coppia più istruita per questo ci battiamo per la child guarantee per garantire cioè ad ogni bambino e ad ogni bambina la possibilità di avere un pasto caldo un tetto sotto cui crescere una scuola pubblica in cui studiare e difendere il modello sociale europeo vuol dire proprio questo scegliere che tipo di società vogliamo creare noi non vogliamo che l'Europa si trasformi in una società divisa e diseguale 
e infine non possiamo inoltre voltare la faccia ai nuovi lavori il digitale è un grande tema non è il tema del domani è il tema del presente è il tema dell'oggi e noi siamo per il progresso tecnologico siamo per la digitalizzazione ma non possiamo accettare che non vi sia protezione nei confronti dei lavoratori che perdono il posto a causa della digitalizzazione del progresso tecnologico non siamo conservatori vogliamo il progresso ma chi è meno istruito chi rischia di rimanere a piedi deve essere garantito anche attraverso come sostiene la nostra collega Meri del Vo attraverso una tassa sulla robotizzazione George e altri colleghi ne abbiamo parlato ed è stata votata una risoluzione del Parlamento europeo su questi temi queste sono le questioni che vogliamo mettere al centro lo faranno meglio di me le colleghe e i colleghi che fanno parte del mio gruppo i nostri vicepresidenti, i nostri compagni ma volevo sottolineare la priorità politica che questo tema rappresenta per noi e non è un caso che noi scegliamo di fare together qui a Gothenburg il giorno prima del summit sul pilastro sociale perché vogliamo mettere la nostra firma politica il nostro peso politico il peso della nostra iniziativa su questa battaglia che non finisce domani domani inizia o domani ha un punto di arrivo per altre tappe e altre battaglie credo che si debba fare un ringraziamento a tutti coloro i quali stanno lavorando su questa splendida iniziativa Together Together non è soltanto la sigla di un magnifico una magnifica sequela di eventi socialisti in tutta Europa ma è anche il simbolo della società che noi vogliamo insieme insieme Together solo insieme potremo vincere le sfide del presente e del futuro all'insegna sempre della solidarietà grazie Tack så hemskt mycket. Nu ska jag ge ordet till Göteborgs borgmästare. Brukar man översätta det när man säger på, på engelska. Men hon är ju kommunstyrelsens ordförande. Extremt upptagen den här veckan och ikväll. Över 20 statsöverhuvuden. Dessutom EU-kommissionärer, EU-parlamentariker som vill underhållas och prata med dig ikväll, Ann-Sofie. Men du har valt att komma hit och vara här en liten stund med oss också. Varsågod, ordet är ditt. Vill du stå där? Eller? Ja. Tack så mycket. Ja, jag tror jag står här. Uh, thank you, Gianni, for your uh, wonderful speech here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Gothenburg. It is an honor and indeed a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, to me, opening this uh, together event is uh, certainly a bit personal, I can say. Um, before coming the mayor of Gothenburg, uh, I used to work as a national coordinator <laughs> for the Swedish delegation of the S&D group. So coming here tonight is a pretty much a family thing. What do you say, Marita? <laughs> what, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, what uh, you will experience in Gothenburg is a city in positive flux. Uh, over the next 15 to 20 years, we will be going through a major transformation. We will do two things at the same time. First, we will implement an ambitious infrastructure investment plan. The transport infrastructure uh, of the city will be quite radically strengthened. New bridges, tunnels, roads and railways will be built. A new cableway will be set up across the river. Second, we will also invest heavily in modernizing the cityscape. Through the creation of the state-of-the-art river city area, a substantial volume of housing and business facilities will be constructed on the banks of the river. While realizing the transformation, we are renewing even the character of Gothenburg. A classical industrial city is being turned into a leading high-tech city. Gothenburg will remain industrial, but will be so in a more multifaceted and knowledge-intensive way. And a crucial part uh, of this transformation 
is the promotion of social sustainability. Increased equality is at the very core of our modernization effort. Uh, the program Equal Gothenburg uh, is being developed and implemented in an ambitious and promising way. This program is not only about decency, seeking to guarantee that also the least well-off citizen can have a reasonable good life, it is also about prosperity. When making society more equal, you also get a bunch of positive like, things like stronger growth, uh, enhanced trust, and better uh, public health. So to promote social uh, sustainability, it's not an easy thing to do. There seem to be no quick fixes or easy ways out. You must be in it for the long term. This is the philosophy of uh, Equal Gothenburg. Whatever is being done, in terms of establishing family centers, preventing school dropouts, facilitating labor markets inclusion, or supporting civil society in disadvantaged neighbor neighborhoods, we strive to make activities both permanent and predict predictable. There are many, things, uh, many positive things to be said about the agenda of the summit. I'm happy about the reinforcement of the social dimension, the signing of the social pillar, and not least, a fresh start uh, for the social dialogue. And interestingly, this agenda is very much a reflection of what we are trying to do in this city. Uh, the local and the European levels are quite beautifully connected. Gothenburg now, uh, is now a lot about the summit. We are delighted to be hosting such a unique event, and I still struggle to grasp that all of Europe is actually coming here just to push forward the social agenda of the EU. This is a very big thing indeed. So, even, I apologize for the weather, they say it will be better tomorrow. <coughs> Welcome to Gothenburg. Let the work begin. Thank you. Tack så hemskt mycket, eh, Ann-Sofie. Vi ska gå vidare i programmet med Göteborgs eget stadsråd. Från Rymdtorget 5 i Bergsjön, Göteborgs stolthet. Annika Strandhäll, varsågod. Ordet är ditt. Minist Socialminister i den svenska regeringen. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you for putting the stairs there. I think I would have struggled with the chair, so I'm very happy about that. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I would like to welcome you so much to my wonderful hometown of Gothenburg. And uh, as the former speaker said, I'm sorry about the weather. I'll hope it be better tomorrow. Unfortunately, in Gothenburg, normally it rains not that way, but that way, you know, because the wind blows <laughs> as well. But it's a lovely city, so very welcome. Um, tomorrow, my wonderful Prime Minister, Stefan Löfven, and the President of the European Commission will be welcoming the European heads of state and government together with the leaders for the social partners, the civil society, to the social summits on fair jobs and growth. That this meeting is taking place is a big su success for everyone who wants to put fair working conditions and inclusive growth higher up on the political agenda. So I'm so happy. You know that Europe is the second smallest continent in the world, and it's far from the most populous, but in many ways, we are so rich. We have a, a European culture with world-famous composers, musicians, authors, and artists, and we have a high standard of living. And actually, as you know, we are also the second largest market in the world. But the world is rapidly changing. 
The United States are leaving the climate agreement. The development on the Korean Peninsula is worrying, to say the least. More people are displaced today than any time since the Second World War. Equality and good fundamentals for everyone is not just morally, morally right, it is also economically smart. There is a growing body of evidence that widespread inequality is bad for growth in advanced, emerging, and developing economics alike. Europe needs more and better jobs. Decent work and fair working conditions are crucial for Europe's economic growth and productivity. You know that the open single market and the freedom of movement have been a driving force for economic growth and development. But it must be complemented by a strengthening of citizens' rights. We cannot have a union that exists for the market. The union has to exist for its citizens. To create inclusive and sustainable growth, build trust in our institutions, and support for international cooperation, we must ensure more equitable outcomes where opportunities and prosperities are shared by all men and women in Europe. And at the same time, we are battling our own challenges in Europe, aren't we? In some European countries, the current development is in violation of our basic values. The aftermath of the financial crisis is yet to be felt. And in recent years, we have seen a growing mistrust in the ability of politicians to solve these challenges. We struggle with populism, we struggle with xenophobia, and at the same time, one member state has chosen to leave the union. We who share the political responsibility for Europe and its future must shape up and increase our efforts to deliver better answers to the challenges that we are facing in Europe today. The conditions of the European labor market must be fair and decent. People moving to other countries for work is something good, but must not lead to companies competing on lower wages, poor working conditions, or lapses in safety at the workplace. To protect the working conditions of men and women, ensure market com competition based on efficiency, innovation, and to protect the legitimacy of the free movement. Cross-border work must be combined with the fundamental principle of equal pay for equal work at the same workplace, and conducted in the line with good working conditions and good working environment. Fair working conditions need to be a self-evident part of the EU cooperation, while the competence of member states, the national labor market models, of course, the autonomy of the social partners, and the statue, status of collective agreements are respected. Growth and social fairness need to go hand in hand. Putting men and women to work and ensuring equal opportunities in the labor market are key for reducing inequalities and thereby meeting the challenges ahead. And you know you are in Sweden when we speak about gender equality, don't you? So that's what I'm going to do right now. Gender equality is essential 
for sustainable economic development, as well as the development of the labor market and the welfare state. A more gender equal European Union would have also positive GDP impacts. Actually, a Swedish newspaper just today described that if women would work just as much as men in Europe, we would add economically a new Germany to Europe. So that is something to think about. We know that gender equality doesn't happen overnight. It requires know-how. It requires systematic work for development, and it requires resources. And first and foremost, it requires political will <laughs> and initiative. By investing in parental leave, leave childcare, or other care facilities, women and men are given equal opportunities to both work and care for their children, which unlock a vast pool of previously untapped workforce. In the work towards a citizen's Europe, towards a social Europe, and towards a higher level of economic equality, and equality between women and men, the only way to go for us is forward. At times, these steps will be small, but we have to relentlessly strive forward. The social summit on fair jobs and growth starting tomorrow is an important step, and the PES Together initiative is another. If we are going to meet the growing dissolution and distrust among the European people, we have to show that we have higher ambitions that we have goals and high ambitions for our societies, for our economic and social well-being, for our working conditions and our equality. This is clearly stated in the Together initiative that we are taking here tonight. We must value social rights higher than economic freedom. We must have good and fair jobs, a high level of social security, and take on fighting the poverty. This is a clearly stated ambition from the European Socialists and Democrats, and we need to show Europe that we are willing to face these challenges. In Sweden, at least the Social Democrats, we often speak highly of our uh, welfare society, a society where the aim to ensure that you your children and your loved ones are able to travel well through life and who can work and contribute, of course, everyone who can should. But when something happens in life, when it takes a turn for the better or the worse, expected or unexpected, you should know that our welfare systems will be there for you. Our welfare society is in combination with strong unions and extensive collective bargaining, a central part of the Swedish model. With strong and smart systems for healthcare, care, redistribution and financial security in the various stages of life, we not only build a society that stands together, we build a society that allows people to dream, that allows people to dare. It creates mutual trust as well as growth in a society. Our task at hand is to take further steps towards the social Europe and to, in a sense, continue the work for a European model. What unites us members of the European Union is more than just geography, history, and economic cooperation. Fundamentally, really, it's our common values and our way of life, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, 
and their respect for human rights. The challenge is right now, at the moment, the time is always now. Together, and only together, we can build a better Europe. And it is our shared responsibility. Thank you so much. Tack så hemskt mycket Annika. Uh, I ask uh, Annika to stay on the stage because we have given the privilege to two very important people here tonight, two Europe Together ambassadors, to be the first to have the floor. Please, if you have a seat, Annika, I think. Yes, is that fine? Uh, please come on stage. Um, uh, Kimia from Stockholm and Felipe from Portugal. Uh, please come here. So the Europe Together ambassadors have been chosen on the basis of having contributed to the debate. So this is something that we'd like to inspire more people to do. They have been contributing with creative comments, with important insights, with important perspectives to the debate. And we have invited them here tonight to be the first two to ask uh, questions to, uh, to Annika. So who, who of you dares to start? Kimia or Felipe? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, I um, did prepare in a speech, so I. Wait, let's talk. <laughs> uh, dear friends, uh, today I came from Portugal to Gutenberg because I believe that. When, you, when we do um, events like this, we are making history. And it's a great you know, honor to make part of a movement uh, like this, as you do. Um, Uh, today, Europe uh, faces uh, many challenges uh, like populism or a neoliberal agenda and uh, the crisis of refugees. And all, in, all in working together, we can make people see that when they vote, uh, give the tr uh, confidence vote, the vote of confidence on socialists, um, they are truly giving power, more power to themselves. They are giving power, more power to ju uh, social justice and more power to sustainable growth. Uh, so we are here today to talk about this, these topics because we believe and I believe that we see people as people and not as numbers. And that's, uh, let's make history. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Felipe. Felipe studies law but also works as a software engineer uh, and to support his uh, studies and is involved with the Young Socialists of uh, Portugal. Timian, please, you are involved with the Young Social Democrats in, in Stockholm, a passion for social justice. Uh, yeah. And I would say that uh, a passion for people. I would say uh, I'm a, I'm very critical as a person uh, because uh, I see through polit politicians as most people do uh, in today's society, and it's funny how we're standing here and talking about how good Sweden is uh, when we're forgetting the facts that we are big, like massive weapon seller uh, in Sweden. Uh, a lot of our, um, our system is built on blood money and is continue to do that. And politicians, politicians are really, um, they're just uh, products, just as us, our workers uh, and the elite is controlling you uh, with their money uh, and that's what we continue to do um, 
we don't value our lives. Uh, we don't. Uh, we have let money control us <laughs> in a way that it's terrifying. And uh, that's what we continue to do. Um, because we have been talking for a long time. It isn't that people are more aware now, maybe a little bit, but it's like we've always had the same problems, but we're not solving issues uh, because we see the issue in the wrong way, really. Um, we're aiming directly uh, at these areas where we have issues and we don't understand that there are people in the top. They are the biggest problem. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't everyday people. We're just... Uh, we are just... How do you say it? We're, we're just victims of this society, really. And I don't think that we should be so proud of ourselves. Uh, in a way, of course we should. <laughs> it's a wonderful wor world. Um, but we should criticize ourselves uh, more often. Um, that's what I'm trying to say. What's your message to Kimia? Annika, can you inspire her with some optimism? You said before that the... The, the citizens should not exist for the market, but the market should be there for the citizens. Is that uh, something along the message, Annika? Or, or you were not ready? Uh, you mean that I no, should... I, I, was, I was asking Annika, if you, do you have an in, in something to say to Kimia to inspire her to... Yeah, I, I really hope so, because uh, actually I, I, I think like this... Um, I'm born here in Gothenburg. I'm born in, in uh, Bergen. It's a deprived area. I grew up with my mother that was alone with three children under quite difficult circumstances. Uh, it was a tough upbringing for me as well. Uh, and uh, what I see today that I think is really challenging that I went through school and uh, uh, when I uh, grew up I, I met a society where I had the feeling of being left out, you know, and not being included, the feeling of uh, growing up in a, in a, in a segregated part uh, of Gothenburg. Uh, and actually now when I look at my family and look at their children uh, growing up, uh, where I grew up, I can see that things have worsened. Just to, I'm going to give you some hope, hopefully soon. Uh, but actually when we speak about Sweden, one of, of our challenges is also that we see that uh, the gaps between people have increased uh, and uh, our schools in Sweden today uh, are one of the most liberalized schools in the world uh, and actually what was one of the strengths when I grew up uh, was actually that we had a, a school in Sweden that was quite equal so if I was lacking in some parts, I didn't lack when it came to knowledge, and this gave me a uh, strength uh, and a basis to, to work from. Uh, but today, when I see the children that are going to the same school that I did, uh, I can see that they will have a hard journey. And actually, what, what uh, really worries me, and where I think it's so important being a politician today and trying to give people hope that things can change, and things must change, and that the politicians and the people in, in the countries must have the ideas to perform the change. Uh, in Sweden, we have elections next year, and like all the countries around Europe and globally, right now we have the problems, like you said, we have the problem with populism, we have a problem with xenophobia, and we see that uh, people actually that really don't need to, are losing hope uh, because they are losing the trust in the politician. And that was also the, the message that I was trying to convey here, that we have to take a step forward. Um, and I think that if we don't want an outcome uh, in the election in Sweden next year that we have seen in other countries, uh, where the populism and the xenophobia gains new ground. 
I think that the most important things that we can do as politicians is that people, when they are going to vote next year, they will cast their vote because they believe in change and that they believe that change is possible and that we are working together to create this change. If people are going to cast their vote next year because they are afraid, because they are scared, because they think that our society is going to hell, then we won't win that election. And I think that is something that is quite common for a lot of our parties around uh, Europe. And uh, of course we should be, we, we should all the time work and be s with the criticism and uh, look at ourselves and try to be better, but we must also be able to give people hope. I think it's so important. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Annika. Kimia, do you want to respond? Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Uh, I am a very optimistic person. <laughs> it sounds like I'm not, but it, of course I'm here to criticize. Otherwise, why should we be here? Uh, right. Kimi asked me before if someone got offended if she was critical. I said, we, you know, we'd be pointless of you to be on stage if it was not to bring in some criticism and some, and some uh, other views and other, other perspectives. Yeah, uh, but at the same time, we are acting like we have big enemies because we have a lot of power, right? You know, it's like politicians doesn't even have that much power. Uh, because we know who our real enemies are. Uh, I think out of everybody in this room, uh, they know who controls us. So, yeah, in a way we're like spinning around <laughs> the same problems because we don't have, really we don't have that much. We have power, of course, but there's people at the top controlling us too. And that's what I think is sad, but I, I really believe uh, in a better world. Thanks a lot. Uh, we also had Philippe saying that we have a Europe that is dominated by populism, but you also said uh, a Europe that has been dominated by a neoliberal agenda. Do you think, Annika, that this social summit with the introduction of the social pillar can maybe challenge this neoliberal domination, maybe challenge who would decide um, uh, on, on Europe? Well. I have to be optimist, <laughs> don't I? And um, I, you know, I, I have a background uh, also as a unionist since almost 20 years back. And before I became a mini minister, I was a union president in Sweden. And I know the hard work that we put in for a very long time for a social protocol in Europe. So being present here tomorrow, when we take a step that definitely is in the right direction, uh, and now we are going to, to sign uh, this agreement here in Gothenburg. Uh, of course I need to be, be optimistic because I think also that uh, not only uh, the, the countries of Europe are speaking about the importance of, of a social perspective, uh, but also uh, we hear slowly in the, the direction also this tune from other parts where we didn't believe that we would ever hear them, the importance of, of equal societies and that equal societies actually are successful societies if we look around the world. It's the most successful society where you really can, can use the whole uh, pool of, of, of people in taking the country forward. So I, I'm definitely optimistic. I, I think we are going in the right direction and I think the, the challenges that we are facing now with the political climate and, and that is so difficult for us, it also makes us sharper and better and more focused on what we have to do. So yeah, I'm optimistic. Do you want to add something, Felipe, to this? No, I just want to say that when people see that um, social uh, policies works for them, so they, they start to 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 see and, and and to feel that we need we need those kinds of, polit uh, of politics uh, to face the um, the the big capital yes um, that try to oppress us 
uh, more and more in, in name of the, the profit. Uh, we have problems with offshores, uh, the offshores, the, 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 the people in power that um, hide the, 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 the profits to not pay taxes. Uh, and when we can uh, tax this, uh, this money, this big money that, that's hiding, uh, the social policies is, is possible and, and it's more effect, eff effective because uh, we got more, more budgets, yeah? Uh, so I think, I think that we must present our, our, our proposal. Uh, we must implement it and people will see that that's, uh, it does affect uh, in people's life. Uh, I came from Portugal, and in, in Portugal today we we have a, a left government uh, that that uh, uh, they call Jeringonça. <laughs> is is um, the Socialist Party uh, and the two blocks, uh, the the Communist Party and the the left bloc um, in, in power. Uh, so we are d um, giving back everything that the older uh, the the ancestors. Uh, government take uh, for the uh, from the people with a ne neoliberal agenda, and we are develop uh, giving back everything, and it's working, it's working, and you see that people uh, want to to want more, and we will vote for it in the next elections, and with this uh, vote of confidence, we can do more and more. And I think it is this the, the, that we must show to, to people. It's showing and implementing. Excellent, Felipe. When social policies work for people, then we will receive people's confidence and be able to deliver more on, on the social agenda. That was, a, that was a great, I think, positive note. Thank you so much, Felipe. Thank you so much, Kimian. Thank you, uh, Annika. <laughs> So we will move on into the uh, program. Um, now Marita Ullskog will uh, join me uh, here up on stage with an, a, a big number of uh, people. While you all take the, uh, the, the, um, the stage here, please come up, all of you, and use the stairs here, or there are stairs there, uh, and you get seated if in this order would be excellent. Yes, so we start with Agnes over there, Carmen, Georgi, Stavros, Brando, Marina, Evelyn, and Karin over here. Yes, and maybe Marita, where would you sit? Maybe in the middle. Yes, that's fine. So the, so the idea with this part of the program, I will switch to Swedish while they get seated. Tanken med den här delen av programmet är att ha en dialog om några av de allra mest brännande frågorna som kommer upp på det sociala toppmötet imorgon. Och det som vi har, programmet består av en politiker, en medlem av Europaparlamentet och en representant för ett, ett fackligt intresse, en civilsamhällesorganisation. Och tanken är att de börjar med att ställa frågor vi ger en möjlighet till den politiska sidan att ge sitt svar och sen också en möjlighet att följa upp det svaret. Det här har varit eh, svårt. Det är svårt att välja vilka frågor som ska komma upp. Och det kommer också vara väldigt svårt för paren att under de få minuter som de har till sitt förfogande eh, göra det bästa av det. Men jag har som sagt bett om alla att vara så korta och... Eh, Precisa som möjligt. So I've asked all participants to be as short and as spicy as possible in those few minutes. Uh, Marita, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, now we proceed uh, with the next point on the agenda. Uh, this panel is going to be about working conditions uh, with citizens and members of the European Parliament. Uh, the panel will cover posted work, precarious work, uh, the working poor, uh, 
uh, trade union rights, of course, young workers, interns, and uh, digital workers. And these are, as we all are aware of, hot topics. And we are keen to see how on the uh, EU level we can really deal with those problems uh, that, we can, that we can really achieve a change. Uh, it will be a discussion between citizens and members of the European Parliament, and we have a lot to cover, so let's get started. Um, point one, uh, post a precarious work and working poor. Let's start with that part, and I would like to give the floor now to tell us about her experience. Carmen Cassin, who is working as maid and is a worker's representative from uh, UGT in Spain. You have your three minutes to give us uh, uh, all you want to say, please. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, quiero decir que vengo de un sector feminizado y tenemos unos grandes problemas de carga de trabajo. Yo limpio habitaciones en un hotel, soy camarera de pisos, vengo del sector de hospedaje. En España el turismo da mucho dinero pero es uno de los sectores más precarizados. Eh, tenemos un gran estrés, aparte de la dureza física, y nos exigen brutales tiempos de trabajo. No nos reconocen las enfermedades profesionales. Además, por la temporalidad del sector, la rotación de trabajo, los turnos, que se trabaja los 365 días del año, es muy complicado conciliar la vida laboral y la familiar. Y además, eh, yo, por ejemplo, soy madre soltera, hay muchas mujeres que están en, en mi caso, incluso tienen que llevar a cabo el mantenimiento de su familia porque la otra parte no se encuentra en, en paro y es imposible llegar a final de mes con el sueldo mileurista que nos pagan por un duro trabajo que realizamos. Entonces, a mí me gustaría saber... Eh, que todas estas cosas que se van a tratar aquí, que se están tratando del pilar social, de que se va a cambiar la brecha salarial, la precarización laboral y todo esto, eh, de qué forma va a repercutir en, en nuestra vida diaria en un sector tan importante como el turismo y que además es un sector feminizado. Um, thank you, Carmen. I think indeed this, that's, that's the question where we should talk about. How does the social pillar pay, um, um, uh, pay out in, in, in all day uh, uh, life for ordinary men and women working in, uh, in Europe? Or uh, in the case of youth unemployment, trying to find a job, or in case of elderly people trying to survive from pensions which are not sufficient and um, uh, like perhaps a little bit of a strange uh, way of formulating it, but uh, I said earlier today, um, I myself am born and raised in a very neat Roman Catholic family in the Netherlands, uh, um, perhaps a little bit different than Roman Catholicism in Spain, but we know the importance of uh, symbols. Uh, symbols are important and I think what's happening here uh, in Kürtenberg, what's happening with uh, the social pillar is that Europe uh, now presents once again a dream, uh, the optimism um, uh, for a better work for ordinary men and women in, uh, in Europe. Does it pay your bills at the 18th of November? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, but do we, as progressive family, as trade unionists and social democrats, I'm a, a trade unionist myself, it gives us new fuel for a fight much needed because you are talking about your experience in Spain uh, the sad thing is uh, to realize that I think all over Europe, uh, young elderly women working in the tourist sector are being uh, uh, the ones being as, pay, as low paid in, uh, in all countries. So also in the Netherlands, although uh, the average wage is higher, 
de uh, hotel cleaning business is a sector with low wages. Uh, but I think from Gothenburg we should take up the dream that in other Europe is possible, that it's not coming for free, we have to fight for it. But as a trade unionist, you know how to fight, uh, and we just have to fight together. That would be my answer. Yes, you can uh, answer, react to that. Eh, sí, bueno, que me sigue pareciendo muy bonito todo esto que se dice. Desde luego yo soy una mujer luchadora y gracias al apoyo de UGT, un sindicato importante, he podido llegar hasta aquí en representación de muchas trabajadoras de España y yo creo que efectivamente esto es la punta del iceberg de lo que está pasando en Europa. Y que, bueno, lo que sí que espero es que la lluvia de esta bonita ciudad no convierta este pilar en un papel mojado. Can I just present you, Agnes, so that people know who you are? Uh, she is member of the parliament, of course. She is in the employment committee, and she is most important for this audience. She is one of the rapporteurs for the posting of workers directive, and we have started those negotiations uh, actually this week. So, Agnes. Two minutes and then and it's I, I just indeed to uh, I know the, the trade union is important for uh, for you but I also know how many uh, how little uh, uh, real resources there are for your trade union uh, activities so I would say from this panel from her story uh, we should take uh, for our further agenda Let's strengthen social bargaining. Let's strengthen collective action. Let's strengthen trade union movements. Uh, because this morning we visited the Volvo factory where more than 90% of the workers are in the union. Uh, in a sector as the hotel cleaning business, we don't have these high numbers. Uh, but I think it would really help if we could strengthen collective bargaining uh, and put this topic high on our agenda. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, this is a mini battle, really, so we are uh, fighting uh, the timetable. Uh, we uh, go to uh, part two, uh, to uh, actually also once again trade union rights that Agnes uh, were talking about. Uh, first, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Stavros Milionis, who is president of EETEOTE, -E -E, trade unionist from Greece, uh, who will tell us about the specific situation in Greece for trade unionists and how it works. And uh, please, if you can take the floor here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. I do have the opportunity to present you here what happened in Greece after nine years of crisis. My little daughter is nine years old. She is going at the third class of school, and she lives all these years in crisis. You know, from the, from, from the beginning of the crisis, one of the uh, core uh, demands of Troika, and when we say Troika, you know, I think that you know what we mean, uh, Commission, uh, European Bank, and the IMF. Uh, the institution is the, the new name now. From the beginning, uh, the Troika has uh, the demand to uh, restructuring the Greek uh, collective bargaining system. Uh, so, so after, under the first two memorandum, Greece was forced to change uh, the status at the legal framework of uh, collective bargaining system. Uh, now uh, we have a new uh, collective collective bargaining system decentralization with many companies agreement and uh, all this uh, lead us to to have a cut of wages because you know it's different a strong union to negotiate for the collective collective bargaining and it's different a non formal uh, a non formal uh, a non trade union uh, some people uh, to, to go together and to negotiate for, uh, for an agreement. Uh, 
Uh, I want to know what is the position of the party. I think that I know, but I want to, to tell me. Uh, what, is, what, what is the position of the party about uh, the restoration of uh, uh, collective bargaining? And uh, if uh, the answer is that, that I have in, in my mind, the answer is yes. Why? In Greece, every, all the parties support, su support this. In Europe, the biggest parties, and I think uh, you will tell me, uh, do not, not only the Socialist Party support this. Why we cannot find the final result at the end? Okay, uh, question uh, to Mr. Perinsky, Georgi Perinsky. He is a member of parliament, member of our political group, uh, member of the Emplo Employment and Social Affairs Committee. Uh, he is from Bulgaria and he was responsible for uh, a tough work he had uh, uh, earlier uh, during this uh, uh, term uh, dealing with the uh, uh, undeclared work and uh, creating a platform uh, to investigate and to deal with the uh, undeclared work to make it uh, declared. The floor is yours, Mr. Perinsky. Thank you very much, uh, Marita, and thank you for the introduction. On undeclared work, I would only like to mention that among us is Minister uh, Nicholas Schmidt, who was very, very instrumental in bringing this to fruition, after all, uh, through his work in the Council. But uh, answering your question, uh, as you said, you probably know the answer. What is our position? Actually, Maria Joao Rodriguez and another colleague of ours, uh, Jutta Steinruck, uh, addressed a very categorical letter to President Juncker telling that uh, depriving uh, Greece of uh, the right for uh, collective bargaining is an infringement of basic European rights under the Charter. And we have been extremely insistent that this, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking away uh, should be uh, eliminated as quickly as possible. And I understand now that there is a process of reintroducing it, of course, with all kinds of caveats, which would make it very difficult. So this is a battle which we have to keep uh, taking even at this moment. And talking about um, trade union rights and uh, following up on what Agnes and you were saying, uh, you know, this social Europe will not happen because there is a, a European pillar of social rights being proclaimed. It is a struggle. It is a fight. And obviously, uh, a fight is a correlation of forces. And Obviously, uh, the force which has to be generated is the for uh, force of trade union organization. Mm -hmm. uh, you were asking whether we are satisfied with this uh, piece of, um, you know, uh, the, the paper I'm addressing, uh, Lisa. Now, uh, and there is a very important third bullet here that a social union will emerge only with the existence of strong trade unions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now. I can tell you that, and you know, this uh, young lady that was uh, so skeptical here at the beginning, yeah. the only answer to her about the power of those above us, above the politicians, is people power. Mm -hmm. It is the power of trade union organization and it is the power of political organization at the ballot box. Yes. So <laughs> we, we know if we really want to make history, this is what we have to be doing. Because, and permit me just another uh, sentence, uh, the together format we had in Brussels a uh, discussion and a professor from Oxford told us that it will not be getting better, it will be getting worse because of the way that the global market works. It polarizes, it, pull us, it pulls us apart. The minister was saying what she experienced as a child and what is here in Gothenburg now. How do you overcome that? Only by political power, which can regulate the market and which can change, change the trend. Yesterday, in the evening, we discussed in the European Parliament a report by a colleague of ours, Cavio Lopez, on inequalities. Today, we voted. And on several key texts, we lost from three to maybe 10, 20 votes because the EPP does not want a 
social uh, uh, minimum uh, guarantees, does not want the ILO conventions to be applied, does not want to give the money necessary for the child guarantee. And if we want to really change the situation of yourself, of all us, there are the elections in Sweden, in all our countries, and in 2019 in uh, European Parliament. Last words. There is a very important first bullet here on the social protocol as part of the treaty. Now, I believe that the ETUC has a first block, again, about the social protocol, and I'm looking at Esther at the moment, but it says in their text that no treaty change, no inclusion of no kind of fiscal compacts in the treaty if there isn't a social protocol there. So let's be clear, if we want to change things, mm -hmm. if we want to really change things, no more neoliberal uh, agendas, no more neoliberal straitjackets. We have to fight this fight to the end. Thank you. Thank you, Georgi. Stavros? Yes. With, with this opportunity, I, will, uh, I want to, to put two uh, basic issues for us, for Greek, for Greek unions. First of all, uh, what about uh, what is your opinion about uh, contractor workers? You know, the workers that, that are coming from uh, outsourcing. Uh, I'm asking for that because uh, in many companies, in big companies, uh, they used uh, these uh, this, uh, workers in order to, uh, without rights, with very low wages, in order to, like, like a Trojan horse, in order to, uh, to change all the conditions for the other uh, employees and then companies. So we need a, regu a regulation status, about, a regular no, a law about the contractor workers because there is a law, uh, but there are many tricks. They, they use many tricks. For example, uh, they had the employee for 18 months, like is the legal, at the, after 18, 18 months with another company, but in the same office, in the same position, for the same job. Uh, after three, four, uh, four, or four years, they're coming, uh, the company, to uh, the employees, to us, and they say that we have to integrate all these people, and it's right. We have to give them uh, uh, benefits, but you have to, to cut your benefits in order to go somewhere in the middle. Uh, how, what is the position of uh, the party for that uh, issue, one? And the second, I don't know if you are informed, but everybody said that uh, uh, Troika's uh, policy about uh, collective, uh, collective bargaining and all this for uh, the employees' issues are failed. But now, in 2017, Troika is coming, uh, is coming again and asking from the Greek government, asking from the Greek people to change uh, the law for strikes. Everywhere in Europe, if, uh, if a union wants to call on strike, the board of the union uh, have to decide about that. Now, Thank you. One more, uh, three, three, three <laughs> seconds. Now, with uh, uh, the new proposal for uh, Troika, uh, in order to have the, the last, but not, not least, tranche of bailout aid, uh, the, law, the law said that we have to have 51% of all our members. This is impossible. We have 10,000 members. It's impossible to call all of them uh, to, decide for, to decide for a strike. So, tell me. How do you, do you stand about on that? Thank you very much. For some reason, we always want to speak very much on this point, but I have to introduce part three, uh, young workers, internships and traineeships. So I thank you who are sitting here, and uh, uh, I ask uh, just Marine... An, just an answer. <laughs> I will be... You I know, will be ex old men, <laughs> they I never advice. give up. Marita, I'll be extremely short. 30 seconds. We insist on a decent work directive for all workers, and enforcement of this should be through even blacklisting companies that engage in that kind of practice. On the 51% uh, in order to strike, it might exist someplace, but it cannot be imposed on Greece out of the blue because obviously this deprives you of a basic uh, instrument, so we will be asking the Commission what it thinks about this. Thank you, Georgi. Now it's time for Marine Dufour uh, and uh, Brando Benefai. Uh, Marine is a young graduate uh, and representative from the Interns GoPro, who will tell us about her personal experiences and her campaign. 
uh, that will be a short intervention, and that will also be a short intervention uh, from Brando Benefi, who is a member of uh, uh, the Socialists and Democrats in uh, the Parliament, and uh, also, of course, in the Employment Committee, the most important one, <laughs> I'd say, from Italy, who himself is one of our youngest members. Uh, I might add. So, uh, uh, please, uh, uh, we will listen to you, Marin. The floor is yours. You hear me? Yeah. Um, that was funny because um, Mr. Pitella said um, we will know maybe 10 jobs in our lives. Uh, that's true because I know people who are 30 years old and who has already known 10 jobs, 12 jobs as interns. So true. Um, that's a real problem because um, no to enter the job market for young people is not as easy as it was for parents or grandparents. You can't just have a degree and expect to have a job. Like I also know people who have two master's degree and who can't find a job and they're over 30 years old and they just took uh, precarious jobs over and over again. Um, an internship is not a job, or if it were, uh, if it was, uh, it should get, we should get paid for it, um, because for the same job we should get the same salaries. Um, it's the conditions for interns, for trainees, for young workers in Europe are really not what they should be. Um, in France, we are so happy because we are paid 500 euros a month. Um, that's ridiculous to live in Paris. Uh, you need like more than a thousand euros a month just to find an accommodation and maybe to eat a bit. Um, so when I see that in Belgium you can't even get paid because it's illegal and that's unbelievable because now you need five, six internships to get a first real job. Um, so um, there is an emergency here because um, there are some young people who can't even uh, support themselves um, and we just uh, displace real um, employees with interns. Um, so I just quickly, I, I know I take a lot of time. Um, I launched a petition on change.org this year and I raised 50 thousand signatures in like one month uh, because uh, we, we want the government in France but we want like Europe to realize uh, that companies have the capabilities to pay more and they should do it uh, because we need to create real uh, jobs for use in Europe uh, so my question is <laughs> what do you do for young people. Um, there is a problem, but there, there seems that there's no answer yet, or not real ameliorations. Rado Benify, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Well, a few days ago, I was with Interns Go Pro in a, a meeting in Brussels for the Interns Day, because it was just a few days ago, the day, a global uh, movement to make internships paid. Remuneration for internships and quality for the internships is one big battle we started. And I have to say, now in a different uh, hat, as they say in the jargon, uh, as co-chair of the Youth Intergroup in the European Parliament, I have to say that my political group, I work with all the political groups for the uh, Youth Intergroup, my political group has been the one most supporting the big campaign that we are doing inside the European institutions with many uh, also allies like Interns Go Pro and many NGOs all over Europe to stop the unpaid internships in the European institutions. Because uh, uh, now... Uh, the, inside the parliament you can have them. The European Commission says they don't have them, but they do because they use these so-called atypical traineeships to do the unpaid internships. And then you also add them in the e external action service. And we work together with our high representative and with 
the, um, the uh, ombudsman uh, at European level to stop it. And in the international delegations, we stop them. And we can eradicate them because we cannot give, we cannot talk, we cannot proclaim the pillar of social rights and then have inside the European institutions unpaid internships. This cannot be accepted. It's in the recommendations of the pillar. At least us, we have to respect it and give the good example. And so we have been campaigning on that very strongly. And we want, as S&D, to stop um, putting only pilot projects on big uh, uh, social objectives. We have to fight a lot to have the child guarantee become a, become a pilot project to support the education and the basic needs of all children. And we want it to become a real guarantee for all the uh, uh, children and also for, for children that will be young people. Uh, very soon. Thank you, and, Brando. Yeah, and one last thing. I, 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 You'll I, come back. You have two more minutes later. But, uh, okay. Because I spoke only two yeah. minutes. Okay. Marine. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, it, Are you satisfied? <laughs> it's true that we've been working together a few years ago. Um, there are so many things that have to be done, and we have to do it now because things, like we are talking about like two years ago, but things haven't really changed by now, and it's really an emergency because we are our generation, we are the workers of tomorrow, we are already workers, and we are not even paid for it. We don't get really interesting internships. We want to learn. You say interns are here to learn, so they don't have to get paid, but you don't teach them anything, so they're not here to learn either. Um, that's a real problem. Um, I just wanted to say quickly um, that uh, we launched a campaign, it's called Transparency at Work. You can find it at transparencyatwork.org. Um, it's uh, co-financed by the Commission, um, and we want to create a real uh, transparent job market and allow all young people, uh, interns, uh, trainees, um, young workers to go and rate their um, employers um, so that they became transparent and please go rate because it will really, really do a big difference. Yeah, I will take only two minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, the ins uh, I think it's important to support these kind of initiatives. I was at the presentation of transparency at work in the, in the near the European Parliament a few days ago because we need to support the kind of incentives, the good practices, the fact that good businesses, good uh, 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 job places that do uh, use uh, good practices have to be incentivized. As to being said, it's fine, it's good that you're doing it, and you, we need people to know it. So it's good to use this kind of, so of soft approach on the other uh, and support it. On the other side, we need also uh, the uh, laws to protect the workers. And in fact, the quality framework for internships, that it's already uh, a council recommendation. It's been applied by many member states. It's been transformed in laws. But now, with the ap uh, approval tomorrow of the European Pillar of Social Rights, we need to change the approach. Because one topic which is crucial for internships have not been put inside the quality framework for internships. It's the issue of remuneration. And so, on one end, what I'm trying to do myself as an MEP now, for example, working on the Solidarity Corps, is to codify the quality framework for internships. It must not be left only to the member states. As much as possible, we need to force our way, obviously respecting subsidiarity, respecting member states, but if we propose the social protocol, we need to make it living already in what we can already do now and prepare the space for the social protocol to become a real actionable instrument in the treaties for the workers uh, internships and workers in general alike. Thank you. Uh, that means that we can proceed to the, our fourth uh, uh, interesting question, and that is on digital workers. I want to introduce Karin Kneer, a crowd worker from Germany who will explain about her personal experience and the problems of digital workers and worker protection, and that is really one of the headlines uh, for us uh, at uh, this stage, uh, also in the European Parliament. The floor is yours. Einen schönen guten Abend an alle. 
Ich bin Karin Knehr. Ich arbeite seit circa ja, über drei Jahren als Krautworker. Das heißt, ich erledige Online-Jobs, die von Plattformen vergeben werden. Als ich damit angefangen habe und auch jetzt noch, ich bin entsetzt, was sich da für eine Ökonomie und für einen Arbeitsmarkt entwickelt hat. Das ist ein rechtsfreier Raum. Die Worker haben keine Rechte, sie werden ganz schlecht bezahlt und die Plattformen können machen, was sie wollen. Warum brauchen zum Beispiel Plattformen nicht offen zu legen, ähm, wie viele Leute sie wirklich beschäftigen, wie ihr Umsatz ist und wie ihr Gewinn ist. Weil das sind die Grundlagen überhaupt, dass Gewerkschaften, sich, dass Gewerkschaften verhandeln können. Und warum können Plattformen normale Arbeitnehmertätigkeiten sagen, du bist jetzt selbstständig, Du hast alle Risiken zu tragen, du musst deine eigenen Sozialversicherungen bezahlen, da haben wir nichts mehr mit zu tun, du musst deine Steuererklärung machen, aber du verdienst vielleicht, wenn es hochkommt, 4 Euro die Stunde. Geht gar nicht. Und dann frage ich mich, warum, wo die Wirtschaft doch boomt und es allen besser geht, es so viele Menschen gibt und jeden Tag kommen neue dazu, die bereit sind, zu diesen Bedingungen und für so wenig Geld zu arbeiten. Thank you sehr. Uh, and I will now give the floor to Evelyn Regner. She is a member of the European Parliament and of the Socialist Group. And uh, she is, of course, a member of the Employment Committee, but she is uh, 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 very engaged also in the Committee on Legal Affairs. Uh, the floor is yours, Evelyn. So good, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very short uh, 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 remark in English, and then I would like to switch into uh, uh, German as well. I just would like to say, you see, we are so many of us from the European Parliament being tonight here because we are excited that this social summit is taking place in Gothenburg. And so Gothenburg is the symbol of the social issue. And therefore, so somehow, we all in the European Parliament, as we are here, would like to uh, support so much this idea to get stronger. Uh, in all those fields uh, mentioned right now, and now I would like to switch into German. Uh, liebe Karin, wenn ich jetzt eine Frage höre, möchte ich am liebsten gleich uh, bei euch ansetzen, denn im Prinzip geht es um dieselben Probleme, von einem äh, unterschiedlichen Standpunkt jetzt betrachtet. Junge Menschen werden ausgebeutet, indem ihnen äh, Traineeships angeboten werden, wo es keine Sozialversicherung gibt, wo man äh, immer wieder darum kämpfen muss, äh, ist das jetzt Arbeitsrecht anzuwenden, ja oder nein. Und für Crowdwork gilt das Ganze im Großen und Ganzen noch viel schlimmer. Da geht es dann nämlich auch noch los, dass man nicht recht weiß, wer ist denn der Arbeitgeber? Ist der Arbeitgeber überhaupt vorhanden? Ist die Plattform ein Arbeitgeber? Zahlt er die Steuern? Äh, bietet er einen Dienstvertrag an? Was ist denn das Ganze? Und meine A Antwort ist eigentlich eine ganz, eine ganz einfache. Wenn man entsprechende äh, Dienstpflichten erfüllen muss, ist das natürlich das Arbeitsrecht, das anzuwenden ist. Digitale Arbeit ist genau dieselbe wie analoge Arbeit. Das ist genau dasselbe. Und was hier passiert, das ist äh, schlimmster Manchester-Liberalismus und natürlich muss dies geregelt werden. Das Erste ist einmal, äh, viele von uns hier im Raum sind ja auch Gewerkschafterinnen und Gewerkschafter. Organize zusammenhalten. Ich weiß, es gibt jetzt gerade in dem, also weil, weil das auch recht gut passt, Deutschland, Österreich, Schweden schon einen Zusammenschluss von ganz besonders Engagierten, die äh, in diesem Fall leider immer dieses Schindluder erleben müssen. Keine ordentliche Bezahlung, keine Sozialversicherung, man weiß nicht einmal, wer Arbeitgeber ist, also sich zusammenzuschließen. Und weil ich nicht nur so abstrakt daherreden möchte, ein ganz praktisches Beispiel wie wir das versucht haben in Österreich und ich denke mir, manchmal muss man die Dinge irgendwie ganz pragmatisch und vielleicht gar nicht so besonders korrekt, aber dann doch vielleicht ein, ein bisschen mit Lösungen angehen. 
Wir haben so viele Beispiele in Österreich, wo genau das passiert und dann steht jemand da und kriegt zu wenig Geld bezahlt und ist nicht ordentlich sozial versichert. Und daraufhin haben sich einige der Crowdworker, Workerinnen zusammengeschlossen und haben gesagt, ich stelle dich an, du stellst mich an. Und das Ganze hat dann zur Folge gehabt, dass die sich quasi alle selbst versichert haben als Arbeitgeber, damit äh, mehr oder weniger zumindest das Problem der Sozialversicherung gelöst ist. Also eigentlich das Modell einer sehr, würde ich mal sagen, sehr, sehr äh, unkonventionellen Genossenschaft. Das kann nicht das Modell jetzt natürlich sein für ganz Europa. Das müssen wir europäisch angehen, genauso wie die äh, Praktiker. Aber zumindest ist es ein Approach, gemeinsam konzertiert, sich zumindest einmal sozialversicherungsrechtlich abzusichern. Thank you. One minute for reaction from you, Dann Karin. möchte ich ganz darauf antworten, ganz schnell. Und zwar würde das doch bedeuten, dass weiterhin die Arbeitgeber aus ihren sozialen Verpflichtungen rausgenommen sind. Und das geht nicht. Da bin ich komplett bei dir. Das ist natürlich, was ich gesagt habe, das war einmal so quasi die, die Notlösung, um irgendwie äh, über die nächste Runde zu kommen. Das kann nicht die Endlösung sein. Äh, das kann nicht das Ergebnis sein, das wir gerne haben möchten. Die Lösung muss sein, Plattformen sind Arbeitgeber. Wenn Plattformen agieren wie Arbeitgeber, wenn Plattformen äh, äh, verlangen, dass gewisse Leistungen erbracht werden, dann können sie nicht sagen, sie sind ganz neutrale und sie äh, lassen sich mehr oder weniger aus dieser Verantwortung äh, letztlich rausholen. Und hier ist das Arbeitsrecht anzuwenden. Und dasselbe, was wir äh, bei den Stagiaires äh, äh, letztlich versuchen zu machen, nämlich ein Framework, gilt natürlich auch, für die äh, digitalen Arbeitnehmerinnen und Arbeitnehmer. Wir brauchen, und dann bin ich jetzt bei meinem Schlusssatz zu Marita und auf unsere Zeitvorgabe schauen, wir brauchen einen Rechtsrahmen für würdige, menschenwürdige Arbeitsbedingungen. Und menschenwürdige Arbeitsbedingungen, die gelten für alle Menschen. Die gelten für Crowdworkerinnen, die gelten für Stagiaire, die gelten für Lastkraftwagenfahrer, die irgendwo unterwegs sind, die gelten schlichtweg für alle. Thank you all for your contribution and uh, now we will leave the, leave the floor to another strong woman. Thank you so much Marita. I realize I never introduced you. Marita is head of the Social Democratic Delegation to the European Parliament and also acting uh, chair of the relevant uh, committees. You're indeed an expert on these issues, but I see you're also an excellent moderator. You were excellent in keeping time. So you have 35 seconds to spare. Well done. <laughs> excellent. I will now uh, hand over uh, and I switch to Swedish again. Nu har vi äran att välkomna Ann Linde upp på scen som är Sveriges EU och handelsminister. Och jag antar att det för dig också Ann är lite som att komma hem till familjen. Du är den EU-minister som Sverige har haft som har haft djupast och längst erfarenhet av att jobba inom de europeiska och faktiskt globala strukturerna och känner de här frågorna väldigt väl. Jag hoppas att du har tid att mingla lite med oss sen efteråt. Men nu ska du få komma fram till talarstolen. Varmt välkommen an. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, it's, um... It feels very good to be here among friends. Uh, and I can say that sometimes uh, when you have been for a long time in party politics and you go into government, you really miss the party politics. <laughs> so um, I'm also happy to be here in Gothenburg. There has been a big discussion. Why don't you have this summit in some Davos-like place up in the mountains so you don't disturb the streets of Gothenburg and normal people's way to, to go about. And I think this is the reason why we have it in Göteborg, because you could have so many side events, you can talk with a lot of people, being politicians, uh, being from the civil society, being from the trade unions, and that's the reason why we should not hide uh, in a secluded place like they do in divorce. We should be especially here among the people. Three weeks ago, Prime Minister Levein held his speech about the future of Europe at Uppsala University, 
where he highlighted not only the challenges that the European Union stands before, but also how important it is that we, all the member states represented here today, work together to reach common goals. We, the member states of the European Union, have long managed to solve different mutual challenges in a good spirit, and I'm deeply convinced that we can continue on this road also in the future. The Swedish government has three EU policies for 2018, namely economy and jobs, environment, and security and migration. The first priority is economy and jobs. The most important change for the European cooperation was the introduction of the single market, which has contributed to prosperity and a high level of integration in different areas of the European continent. The single market is what the EU was originally built on. As an example, almost 80% of all foreign direct investment in Sweden comes from EU. Of our export, and this is important for me because I'm also Minister of Trade, is 71% go to the EU single market of all our exports. Seven out of 10 exported uh, goods. The Swedish industry, uh, industry uh, is supported by export 1.4 million jobs in Sweden. Removing trade barriers also means 60 million custom documents less each year. I tell this to the Brits all the time. <laughs> Cutting bureaucracy and reducing costs has increased trade within EU by 15% over the past 10 years. Globalization causes markets to become increasingly global. People can move freely and the flow of goods, services and capital can move across borders. The results of globalization speaks for themselves. Over the past 25 years, world trade as a share of the global GDP has increased from less than 40% to almost 60%. Foreign direct investment has increased from less than 10% of GDP to over 30%. Sweden is today one of the world's most competitive countries. The explanation are many in the Swedish economic history. The common thread is openness to international cooperation, structural reforms, innovation and trade but also investment, welfare, and strong trade unions. Trade and growth create jobs. Jobs create possibility for welfare and investments. This is why Sweden supports the EU's new and ambitious free trade agreements with regulatory cooperation, investment protection, public procurement, cooperation on environmental and health-related issues, this agreement shall maintain and strengthen the protection of wage earners, the environment, human and animal health, and respect democratically based decisions. The most important question for the EU in the future years is to make the benefits from growth and globalization to reach all citizens. Social and economic progress must go hand in hand to deliver to their full potential. Nobody should be afraid of social dumping. Everybody should gain from the growing economy. We all share a responsibility and an interest in working for a more inclusive and future-proof Europe where the benefits from growth and globalization reach all citizens. One aspect of the single market is gender equality, as um, Minister Strandhell talked about. And we are a feminist government, and we have a feminist foreign policy. Sweden will push to increase gender policy, uh, um, gender equality, and the number of women in work. Ultimately, this is a question of human rights, democracy, and justice. Women and men must have equal power to shape society and their own li lives, and it's sad that this is still something we cannot take for granted in 2017. 
I definitely believe that, and research backed me up as well. Gender equality is a part of the solution to the challenges faces society today. Gender equality is a matter, of course, in a modern welfare society for social justice and economic development. But working actively with gender equality also is an economical good reason. There is a momentum for these questions to be discussed and for making the social dimension of the EU part of our discussion on the future of EU. This social summit has been one of my Prime Minister's highest priorities. Since taking office, our government have actively worked to advance these issues, both nationally and on the EU agenda. Then, the next EU priority for the government is the environment. Environmental and climate issues are among the areas in which the EU's added value is most apparent. The EU must be world leader in this area, especially when other parts of the world choose to stand aside. I'm glad that important progress is being made in the climate area. The EU is in negotiating binding climate and energy objectives. We need to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases. This is absolutely essential if we are to curb the global warming. It is of great importance that the EU is sending a clear message to the world we stand firm in our commitments under the Paris Agreement and that we are taking responsibility for further generations. We also must work with security to guarantee peace and prosperity for all citizens in Europe. The EU is above all a peace project. In addition to purely military threats, Europe's nations must be able to combat and overcome terrorism, cyber threats, influence operations, violent extremism, and organized crime. And that's just a few examples. You cannot talk about the future of EU without mentioning migration. The EU needs to reach result on the reform of the common asylum system by the end of the year, including on solidarity. We need to see shared responsibility for persons in need of international protection. All member states contribute in receiving asylum seekers and emphasizing the right to seek asylum, the principle of non-refoulement, human rights as well as international and EU law must be respected. We also need to work together with the United Nations on poverty reduction conflict resolution and development in the refugees' home countries to respond to the root causes of migration. I want to mention one of my initiatives, the so-called EU handshake. This is a symbolic handshake that engages actors to work for increased participation in EU affairs. In an EU handshake, the actors taking part undertake measures to strengthen participation, knowledge, and engagement in Sweden regarding issues decided on in EU. The commitment vary in ambition and focus as they are adapted to each actor's context and resources. However, all EU handshakes should entail an increased level of ambition in the EU-related work of each actor. An important aspect of the work is the local and regional EU handshakes entered into with municipalities, regions, and other key actors at local and regional actor. And of course, we have done an EU handshake here in Gothenburg. In total, it's now more than 37 actors that have entered into EU handshakes. And we are working because more and more actors are getting interested. It's, um, it's one of the most, most happy things I do as a minister, going ar around the country and doing EU handshakes with all actors. It's, I really can recommend it to all of you. <laughs> uh, 
And on the Europe Day in 2018, I will invite the actors who have engaged in the EU handshakes to Stockholm to take part in a collective dialogue forum. I don't want this to be only photo ops for the local media. I want them to do real things, to deliver on the pledges. The forum will also be yet another opportunity to discuss the future of EU. Before I finish, let me conclude with one of the most important issues that we have before us here today. That is the discussion on how we want to uphold the common values that we have established together in the EU. Since the start of the European project, the common values that we have tried to uphold are freedom, democracy, equality, respect for human rights, and the rule of law. Unfortunately, these values are indeed challenged today. The rule of law is a common value to all member states of the Union. It is a commitment made in the process to become a member of the Union that, of course, has to be complied with also as a member. Respect for the rule of law also constitutes the basis of our mutual trust and cooperation to be safeguarded. There has to be consequences for countries not following the rule of law. I am in constant contact with my colleague and Vice President of the Commission, Franz Timmermans, to talk about these topics. And I'm very happy with the decision of the European Parliament yesterday about this issue. As social democrats and socialists, we know that democracy and fundamental values such as freedom and respect for human rights is not something that you just establish and then lean back and take for granted. We have to be observant and fight for every part of it every day. The price for freedom is internal vigilance. These are wise and thoughtful words that must be taken seriously. My hope is that we must work together hard to uphold the common values that we have always held so high in the European order, in order in the European Union, in order to create a society that we can proudly hand over to future generations to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, you have uh, offered to answer some of the questions. I, di I did think that's, that's great because then it's one of the reasons we are here. Have you received any questions on Twitter from people who are following us on the live stream that we can raise? Or does anyone in the audience have, have a question? Yes, please. I give the, uh, the microphone. Just short, yes. And uh, many thanks for telling uh, how high is the Swedish engagement for the European idea. You referred to us something very interesting, uh, the EU handshakes. So can you just uh, give you some uh, concrete examples how this is operating in Sweden? Well, the first thing we did was that the government made pledges uh, because we had a report that showed that the information about EU, the knowledge uh, in people about EU, and the influence on EU was very, very low. We could see in this report that 72% of the newly elected uh, politicians, they thought they knew so little about EU that they didn't dare to have a discussion with their own voters on EU. And then there was a, a check on teachers, journalists, the politicians, and the civil servants. And all of those groups that should talk with the members of the society about EU, and all of them knew very little. They didn't dare to have a discussion. They thought that they have to be so clever about everything in EU they don't know everything about the parliament, but they, they won't dream about not speaking about politics in the parliament, but they didn't dare to, to t talk about EU. So we say, okay, we have to do something about this, but it's a too way wide task for the government. So we say, if we make pledges from the government on what we should do to increase the engagement, to increase the influence, 
to make in, uh, information better and to see to that people have more knowledge. That's our uh, pledges. For example, we have now a new democratic instrument in the government. So before we take any big EU decisions, we call in actors to the government. It could be trade unions, it could be civil, so, uh, civil society, it could be anything. I had one of those uh, um, EU policy councils last week on the globalization. We have had those on each of the white book. We had one on the service package. And you get so much more and better uh, decisions when you get the influence in this very structured way. For example, on the service directive, I thought most of the things were very good. But we, then we had one of those. <laughs> we, we have one of those. Uh, uh, councils and uh, it seems like many of the trade unions and employers organization didn't like it so much so we I think we have to change our, our mind on this then we ask the actors yeah <laughs> then we ask the actors this is our pledge and I also put money in, in, in the different what could you do so for example the, the cities they said okay we we will do a, a new home page on EU affairs uh, the agencies, they say, we will now give the information on who are our experts in all different kind of groups in EU so that you can, you can have contact with them and, and influence them. Uh, the youth organizations, all the youth organizations has also made pledges. Um, they will start seminars, they will work for different issues uh, to be more involved in EU affairs. And we have all the social partners, uh, the ELO, TESEO, SAUCO, the, the Swedish Employers Organization. And, th and then they promise to get it, for example, into their ordinary education um, activities to also put EU into that. That was not there before. So it's all these kind of pledges. It's, it's really, really fun. <laughs> one, one more very short uh, question from, from here. Yes, one more very short question, please. The program of European Studies here in Gothenburg, and I don't know if this is not really a short question, but I will try to be brief. And it's really nice to <coughs> come here to talk about social welfare and how to reach common solution among a more equal European society. However, I heard the impression that during this discussion we just uh, touch superficially among all the real problem that uh, now the European society is facing and uh, about social dumping, how to really control this uh, uh, phenomena uh, where the, uh, basically the Western European country moved to Eastern European uh, countries because they have a low labor cost and uh, at the same time seems like the Eastern European country are the one that gain but uh, in reality are the losers as well because they lose high skilled workers that move to Western European countries because have higher salaries. So the main point here is that SEC uh, just lose uh, high skilled workers and um, um, the West society face competition from the East partner. Yes. And this is the society that overall lose the mm -hmm. So what to do about social yeah. dumping? What's your answer? Yeah, what's the, the among benefit and cost? And touching really briefly about what the Italian politician said is true that nowadays you can have 10 works and have, it's so nice to have the possibility to uh, try all your skills and competences. But then what's the point if you uh, lost the rights in the work with the liber uh, liberalization of the market? So I have 10 works, but then I do not have... A, any permanent job for my life or any insurance on that so yes. thanks thanks a lot uh, a, a short answer Anne, if you can please i think one of the most important answers to the first part of your question is the uh, changing now in the posting of workers directive that it should not be uh, possible anymore to to have a race to the bottom and to take the lowest wages, but you should have to pay the same wage for the same job in the same country. So I think going step by step uh, to, to um, 
avoid this uh, competing with bad working environment, lower wages, that is the best answer. But that is, of course, you need political, uh, political will, you need majority. It was like uh, Marita said that we were at another meeting before this meeting, and she said there, there was a question like that, and said, we don't have a majority from the Social Democrats. You need to vote. One of the most th best thing you can do is to go out and be active in the election campaign and get more socialists into the European Parliament. That's uh, one way of, of uh, stopping the, the social, dump, uh, social, uh, social dumping. Yes. Thank you so much, Anne. A big hand for Anne for joining us tonight. We're moving on to the, to the um, second last part of the program tonight, a political panel. Can I ask all panelists please to join me uh, up here? Uh, we have a panel <laughs> consisting of trade unionists and also of members of the European uh, Parliament who will share their political positions and also try to reflect on what has been said earlier this, this evening. So if we try in this, yes, from you here, yes. So I start... Um, from my right, we have Monika Andersson, who is uh, Arvidsson, who is analyst at the Swedish Trade Union Confederation (LO), and then next to her, Agnes. Where is Agnes? Yes, you there. Yes, Jongerius, who is a member of the European Parliament and coordinator for employment and social affairs, and you're also vice chair of the Employment and Social Affairs Committee of the European Parliament. And next to her, Esther Lynch. Uh, from the Confedera Confederal Secretary at the European Trade Union Confederation, the ETUC. Warmly welcome, Esther, as well. And here next to me, Maria Joao Rodriguez, uh, uh, Vice President of the SND uh, Group at the European Parliament. And yes, Connie Reuter is here as well, Secretary General of Solidar. And then, <laughs> sorry, I'm blocking your way. Uh, Nicola Schmidt, who's Minister of Labour, Employment and Immigration of Luxembourg, and also Chairman of the EPSCO Network of the Party of European Socialists. Warmly welcome all of you. These people have been patient all evening and they have prepared very short and spicy statements uh, indeed. I'll start, if you're ready, uh, Monica, with giving the floor to you on how to improve working conditions and promote social justice in Europe. What would be your main priorities, please? Um, I will start with, tr uh, with the problem uh, of uh, atypical work, uh, low income, weak social infrastructure, uh, difficulties in combining uh, work with leisure, all these problems that uh, severely affect people's possibilities and potential for decent, uh, for decent living conditions. Um, it's obvious that Europe really needs a social dimension. Um, and how to do this? Well, one part of the answer will be on, uh, on the same uh, principles as tomorrow's summit. Uh, which will be focusing on uh, jobs, growth, and also social dialogue. Um, tomorrow's social partners are invited to present uh, good examples from both national and European levels uh, on how trade unions and employees' organizations can actually work together uh, to improve both working conditions but also effectivity at, um, at work sites. Um, so hopefully this summit for tomorrow will be an inspiration for improving social dialogue in member states but also on European level because that would be one essential key for progress. Uh, but um, a part of that, there's another uh, three keys I would say. Uh, one comes down on national governments uh, to procure, procure productive social security within the member states, that's also key. Um, and both uh, on EU level and national governments should also bring in social partners, that's essential, to help deliver uh, on market labor, uh, labor market issues. Um, and the fourth would, would be in a longer term to also um, work for social protocol and this would uh, be key to give legal uh, ground for EU citizens' social rights. Um, so working together um, 
and increasing social justice. That's really the only way to, on the one hand, increase uh, our economy's uh, possibilities to be sustainable, but also to transform our European Union to really be a generally social Europe. So that will be my four key principles. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks a lot. We move on to uh, Agnes. Uh, what would be your main priorities when delivering on how to improve working conditions and promote social justice? Uh, I think... Uh, just let's start by celebrating that there is a social summit. Uh, because I think for our political family, who are always thinking of a glass is half full, it's every now and then a good thing just to celebrate the progress we are making and the fact that there is a social summit and there is a proclamation uh, that helps and that helps us in moving uh, the debates further and uh, indeed asking for an inclusion of a social progress protocol for a directive uh, uh, on decent work, for recognizing social dialogue and indeed coming up with this two already long existing uh, uh, agreements at the European level uh, and tabling uh, that uh, to, uh, to uh, have this indeed social dialogue in the heart uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the movement forwards. Um, I think it's important to celebrate this, to use it as our fuel for the next fight. Uh, and I thought perhaps, uh, uh, because it should also be on hope, let me tell you one story from my own home country, A very small story. Um, Deliveroo, you know, this uh, young uh, uh, kids with these bikes uh, delivering our uh, meals at home. It was also in the film. Uh, and in the Netherlands, those kids, they started their own union. They call it themselves the Riders Union. Uh, and just this week, uh, with the help of my political family, they said we're going to ask for an employment contract because we think we are entitled to, uh, uh, to this. So why is this hopeful? These are young people starting a union with the help of our political family. And now they are asking via a crowdfunding action for uh, the funding uh, for this legal action. And I must say, of course, if you want to donate, please uh, 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 come to me. But it's also a sign of hope that young people are working together and trying to get a better life, which is most deserved. Excellent. Thank you so much. Monica put place the social partners at the core and at the heart of the social summit tomorrow, and they're a very important role in the summit and in the implementation. You remind us about the daily struggle of the social partners, or at least the trade unions on the labor market of today. Esther Lynch from the ETUC, what would be your most important priorities in, in this aspect? Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, trade unions from all over Europe arrived in Gothenburg this morning, and the reason we did that was to have our own trade union summit. And the idea of the trade union summit was for us to discuss mostly the European pillar of social rights. And you're right. We said we need to celebrate the summit tomorrow, and we need to celebrate the very real achievement. But we recognized that this isn't the AAA social Europe we were promised because the AAA would be the best Europe could do on social issues. It's not the best Europe could do, but it is the best we could achieve. And by we, I mean working together with our brothers and sisters in your family and in the trade union family. And the best is important and meaningful. And it's important and meaningful because it provides a threshold of decency below which no one in Europe should fall. But to make that a guarantee, our work is only beginning. We're going to have the fight of our lives, I think, on our hands in the next months. Because while we had a big fight to get a lot of member states, including my own from Ireland, to agree to, to write down the idea of rights on a page, imagine how hard it's going to be when we say, well, we need a law to make it real. 
We need you to put finances in to make it real. But I'm optimistic we can do it. And the reason I'm optimistic we can do it is because I've been invited all over Europe to events like this where people are saying, we need to work together. That you're either for social rights or you're against them. It's not about you know, these little tricky bits of law or about these complicated questions. It's a simple question. Are you for rights or against them? If you're for rights, let's get together. Let's work together. Let's get a plan. Let's get our action plan together. Let's demand the action plan from the commission. Let's demand it from our member states. And really, that's, that was, uh, that's what we've spent the day discussing. It is what needs to go into our action plan. And if I get some questions, I'll talk a bit more about that. Thank Excellent. You. Get the rights down on paper, make sure that they can be implemented and put finances into their implementation uh, as well. Very strong message there from the ETUC. Uh, Maria Joao, what, what would be your most important priorities as a member of the European Parliament on these issues? Uh, well, uh, let me tell you, um, the purpose of all these social pillar is to rebalance the European House. Because in the European House, we have a strong economic pillar, we have a s strong financial pillar, but the social pillar is too weak. And we need to change this, because otherwise there is no future for the European Union. And our leaders, they need to understand this once and for all. So what we want with the social pillar is first to update social standards for everybody, for children, for young people, for women, women, when they uh, work and they have their family life. But let me focus particularly because uh, someone there raised this issue. Um, let's go to the real in-depth problem what is happening in the labor market today. Particularly when we see what is happening around the online platforms. This is just the beginning, let me tell you. This digital revolution, which is a positive thing, we need to frame it in such a way that everybody, and there are now millions, and there will be much more millions, uh, if they work there, they need to have two things very important. One is a clear and decent labor contract. And the second is full access to social protection. Whatever the kind of job. So this is really the welfare system for this century, the, the 21st century. And we need to turn this into law. Mm? We are involving the social partners to design this, but at a certain moment, if they cannot reach the agreement and we need it uh, urgently, we need to table law. Mm? And this will come. And we got the commitment that we will have it already in December. Then we need to use the pillar because the proclamation tomorrow, look, this is just the first stone. We need to add the others. A stone about the standards, a new stone about real financial means to implement this. Think about a social right which is there in the proclamation for tomorrow, the social right to lifelong learning. This is a costly investment to really open the opportunity for everybody. So we need to make sure that national budgets, they can provide this investment, or if not, they can be complemented by the upcoming European budget. Mm? So these are concrete consequences of this social pillar, but let me tell you, this is my last word, we also need to have powerful politics. Let's see, we'll come tomorrow taking this commitment. And once they sign up, they will be accountable. So we will ask them, you now you need to deliver in your own countries. And we need to make sure that the European institutions will also deliver. So that's why the proclamation is useful. Because this is a formal commitment, but then we need to turn this for real, pushing with our large coalition. Thank you so much. Set standards, make sure they can be implemented and then push for their implementation on all levels through, through um, very strong politics. Uh, Conny Reuter, please, from Solidar, uh, what, are, what would be your most important priorities on this issue? 
Yeah, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. I think it's an excellent day because we started with the trade union. We had then the meeting. Maria was there also with the civil society and now with the political family. I think this is how the things should work. Yeah, this is complementarity. This is partnership. This is alliance. And this is needed because what Maria has been saying, tomorrow that will be, even if the weather is not so good, it will be a nice moment. We are happy that finally, after all, after the time that we had a social agenda calling for it, for years, for years, after a time where we were told that Europe 2020 would be the social agenda, and it was just buried without organizing a funeral services. It had just disappeared, but we had the European semester process that continued. So the question is now, with this in hand, the pillar of social rights, if this is only a promise, this will be really disastrous, because I think though the political representatives, the trade unions, and also in our civil society, we hear from time to time also they say, yeah, a pillar of social rights is good, but this is interesting for you in Brussels. No, it is not interesting for us in Brussels, it's interesting for all. But there is a reluctance, because we, and this is always what we are useful for, for capital, yeah, neoliberals, conservatives and others, social democracy, progressives are needed in times of crisis yeah, to contain it. But I think we should not be so nice anymore. Now, if we have the proclamation of the pillar of social rights, we will do something which we have been calling in former times social impact assessment. That means there cannot be any decision or any legal initiative at European level, even if it called, is it's called better regulation, which often is a worse regulation, if there is not an impact assessment in the social dimension and to look whether this is not under the umbrella of the pillar of social rights. What is this important also for us? If you look to the pillar, it does not start with employment, and I think it is good. It starts with education. It starts also with social services, and this is our understanding, because social policies are larger, everybody knows it, but sometimes we reduce it on the other thing. But as Maria was also saying, it will need an investment. Yeah? We have, and I think this is a good news, we have lost in Germany, in the government, the Taliban of the Black Zero. Yeah, he has now another responsibility, being the president of the parliament and playing a more democratic role over there. But we have a big elephant in the room who is absent tomorrow, that is Merkel. Nobody coming from the German government, we were told. And I think, well, Udo certainly agrees with me, this is, is a catastrophe. Even if they are not from our political family, I think a commitment from this big country in Europe playing an important economic and political role not to be present on something, whereas Merkel and others always had something to say to Greece, to Spain, to Portugal, to these countries, this is not acceptable. <laughs> and I must say, well, I'm a European German, or German European, like many uh, other Germans in the room, but it's a shame for us. I really feel ashamed tomorrow that even this chancellor who is always pretending to be leader of Europe is not showing up. But let me conclude on something else. I think it's also a responsibility for us to be credible because we have nice speeches. And when people lose trust, it is sometimes also because when you are in opposition, it is easier to speak. When you are in government, it's more difficult to do. The question of credibility is a key, but it concerns also our sector. It concerns the sector of social economy and social services, which is, in the last years, the most growing sector in terms of employment. But we have all the disastrous realities of platform work, of unpaid work, of informal economy, and so on. Therefore, also in our sector, first of all, we have said we need also to establish a social dialogue. And together with EPSU, there is now a federation of social employers because there is a necessity for these informal care workers who come from the Czech Republic or from Slovenia to the UK to Germany or to other countries who are not paid, who have not a working contract, who are well, irregular in irregular working conditions like the, uh, the deliverers. I think this is something where we really have to push also to, if we want to be credible, we need also to promote this. And last but not least, yes. it has been said also, we should not underestimate how important is public opinion. Because this poison of modernism, flexibility, work-life balance, this sounds so nice. But if you look behind, what is the cruel reality? And the last statistics and last studies have shown it. The pressure on the work itself is so high. So that we must also gain the public opinion. Yes, 
it is, has nothing for modernism not to have a regular working contract. It is not modern at all not to be socially protected, and so on and so on. But this is something where through media and others, the poison in the mines is there, yeah, because consuming for low cost, flying low cost, everybody likes it except me. But the point is, if we want really to make also the assessment of the pillar of social rights, we need also to work on the public opinion our opinion, our values are clear, but we need to gain also these majorities because it has been said it is nothing worse if you do not have a political majority to put this in place, then all the efforts for tomorrow, the glass will be half empty or even more, but I think we can put more water in it, not only because it rains from time to time <laughs> in Göteborg. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much, Connie, and thank you for reminding us what, what the, the high stakes are and what hard work is needed after the summit indeed to, to measure success or lack of success and, and hold both EU institutions and member states and indeed our own family also accountable to, to that. Please, our last uh, uh, speaker in this panel, Nicola Schmidt, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, we are all happy that uh, in Europe now we have recovered we have growth again. Even uh, uh, our growth in Europe is higher than the growth in the US. And uh, all the economists say, predict that this growth will be rather steady. So this is a very positive point. But the point is, what happens with this growth we have achieved? What about social justice? What about the losers and the winners? Who will be the losers? Who will be the winners? of this recovery, of this growth we have again uh, uh, achieved. And here I think uh, first point, and I join absolutely what the trade union movement says, we have to make sure that the gains of this growth are, equal, are fairly distributed, which means in very easy terms, a pay rise, a real pay rise, because I think after so many years where pay in Europe has been stagnant or has even gone, da gone down, it is really time for a new distribution of the, of the gains of the uh, recovered growth. Second, when I listen to what uh, uh, was said previously by Annika also about the social problems, when I listen also what has been said during the f uh, uh, at the first at the uh, previous panel. We have a lot of social problems left, a lot. And even there is an increased number of social problems because our societies have, gone not, not, have not come together but have gone, up, uh, have gone apart. And this should mean, well, there is a huge, huge avenue for social democrats. And what happens? we are losing in many and many countries the election. So there is something going wrong there. And I think it was said, we are not managing, we are not succeeding in giving first hope to those who should join us. We are not convincing them that we have the right solutions. And this is a big problem because we cannot change things if we have no political majorities. Out of the opposition, well, you can uh, uh, talk a lot and so on, but we cannot. We have not the tools to change it. So it is absolutely important to find the right new social democratic narrative for the present and for the future. And for the present and the future, there are the big issues which have been mentioned. Poverty, those who are excluded. How can we assure that our education systems function for everybody, not for a small elite. What about not just jobs, but quality jobs with rights, with uh, barg social bargaining, with uh, also good working conditions? One word on working conditions. In, two, uh, in 2015, sure? 2015 uh, we adopted, council adopted conclusions on working conditions. And in these conclusions, we referred very explicitly to the new economy, to the digital economy, and we clearly said, well, there is a need for framing, as you have expressed it, this new economy in terms of better working conditions, of uh, 
uh, uh, rights in this new economy. What has happened since? Nothing. Nothing. Uh, there is no debate on globally on uh, working conditions, and there is nothing on the working conditions of the new crowd workers we have heard what, uh, what it means, and on the new digital economy. This is something which we should really take and put it on the table and on the agenda. And certainly the social pillar can help us to do that. That should be an instrument, a tool, even I would say a weapon to bring that in the political uh, debate at a national level, but also at the European uh, level. So I think uh, uh, we have to uh, reflect on our own, on the way how we reconnect with uh, citizens, with uh, our former voters, we have lost, we have to admit that. We have also to address the anxieties of the citizens. And these are not only those who are already excluded from society, who are turning very often to the extreme right, to the populace, to all those who play on their anxieties. We have also to address the anxieties of the so-called middle, middle class, because they see that the basis of the uh, good jobs, good work, stability, security in their life are disappearing. And these anxieties are dangerous. They are dangerous in social terms, in economic terms, and they may become dangerous in political terms. So we have really to reconnect also with these people and give them a perspective for real security in their lives. What people are looking for is a good life and also some security for themselves and some secure pers perspectives for their children. And that's what social democracy is all about. We have perhaps we had forgotten it a bit in the past because we had also been a bit attracted by this uh, dogma and this mirage of uh, neoliberal thinking. But that's over now, and now we really have to uh, find our own narrative again and uh, really speak to the people, convince them, and we will give you. Thank you. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a good way to open the question and answer session as well. Two members of the public who are here and to raise their anxieties, to remind us about your aspirations, your dreams, your demands to the people in the European Parliament, to trade union representatives, to the social partners who will be gathering at the, at the social summit tomorrow. Are there any questions here from the audience? Have you received any questions in social media, on Twitter, that we would like to, to address? The time, uh, the evening is, is grown late, and we do have an opportunity to, to stay and, and to talk as well informally with, with each other. I'm looking for the organizers to get an advice. Shall we? Uh, yes, we take one, one question and then we, we move on here uh, and in green. Okay, hello. Um, my question is regarding this narrative to get more people along and also concerning uh, the term sustainable growth which I have a hard time to make add up for myself. Uh, I come from an economic background which is very, what you say, privileged and I feel our average uh, lifestyles in wealthy countries like Sweden uh, we may need to need to have a dialogue about us who, who have such good life to maybe accept a lower material uh, standard that we cannot consume so much and have such a high footprint in uh, the amounts of resources and carbon footprint that we produce. It's not popular among voters, but for me to have a dialogue about our lifestyle being highly unsustainable. Um, still, there are other people in Europe that sh certainly should have a fair share of our growth, but maybe we need to accept a few steps back, and uh, that's what I would like some uh, reflections on, if that's we, possible we, as a story, to include in a story. Yes. Are we too focused on economic growth and too, too little focus on sustainability? What, what should be our priorities in this aspect? Uh, Esther, do you want to? Yes. Well, 
The way I think about that issue is this, is um, workers should get a fair share of the profits that they create. Um, at the moment, we have the 1% taken more and more and more of that share. And when the 1% takes more and more of that share, it doesn't go into the local economy. It goes into really risky pieces of the economy. It goes into financialization. It doesn't go into investment for jobs. It doesn't go into investment for training. They, they keep it in, uh, in the problematic bits of the economy. So I'm all for a pay rise. Um, for me, sustainable growth means that. It means that growth is shared properly with everybody. Um, certainly the majority of union members um, who are finding it difficult to get a pay rise struggle to make ends meet. Um, they can't afford um, choices. Um, they struggle, you know, um, because they're tired from the amount of work that they do. They've very long commutes very often, and when they get home, they're really trying to make choices between the amount of energy they have because they have to go up tomorrow really early to go into work, to do the homework with the children, to cook the dinner, to clean the house, and, and all of those things. So for me, that's what the European Pillar of Social Rights is about. It's about trying to make sure that those people who are struggling get their fair share and that that is what we're talking about or certainly that's what trade unions talk about when we talk about sustainable growth now of course we also talk about a just transition so that's what we were looking at in volvo this morning was how do you make sure that people aren't thrown on the scrap heap and um, that we don't say well we don't need you anymore either because you've been replaced by a robot or because the industry is in decline that we make sure that the, that the profits that a lot of companies are making are put back into make you know giving people a second chance at education or at training and i often use myself as this example i mean i'm a woman in my 50s i'm a lawyer if you look on the list of jobs that robots are going to replace i'm always on the top three i have no idea what i would do if i lost my job like no no clue I don't know how I'd afford to pay my mortgage if I had to go back to college for three years I don't know how I'd afford college for three years I don't know how I'd afford the type of help my family needs from me so I think that's what uh, Nicholas Schmidt was talking about which is I think people are fearful of the future and they don't see that there are solutions there for them they don't see that there are adequate safety nets there for them and again that's what we mean by sustainable growth that people have to have some belief that should a bad circumstance fall on them, either they got ill or they got sick or they lost their job, that there are adequate safety nets there. So sustainable growth is about making sure that everybody contributes into a system and on the day that you need it, it's there for you. So I, I think all of those questions have to be considered um, in, a, a, in a discussion on what is sustainable growth. Mm -hmm. A fair share of the growth that's already happening and a fair transition into more sustainable uh, growth as well and the kind of more sustainable economy that we need to create. Uh, Connie asked for the floor as well. You'll be the last speaker, I'm, I'm sorry, because we need to move on into the, into the program. Yeah, two, so, two or three short thoughts. Number one, the question of growth. Indeed, I was a little bit astonished that uh, when we were um, the day before yesterday in Dublin with the Eurofound, uh, that the only reference was growth, and I thought we had left this behind us. Um, it, I'm not speaking in favor of degrowth, but we had the discussion beyond GDP. We had the discussion of what would be other indicators, and then we come back only on GDP. And I think this is not sustainable in a sense. That means this is also something where we have to come back. We have something in our hands, which is the well, sustainable development agenda, the 2030 agenda. And I think the pillar can really go into it and we need to discuss indeed can we continue to live at this level and this is not to say we have to renounce on many things but do you need to fly to Barcelona for six euro? I'm not convinced. Do you need to go to Primark yeah, and buy clothes for nothing that you throw away the next week because you are too tired to clean them? These are realities of consumer behaviorism also and I think if we don't I, should, I think for the social democrats the answer is always very easy it is just to say Every price have a price. 
every price has a price. You know what is the problem of Ryanair, you know what is the problem of Primark, you know what is the problem in the textile industry, and I think this is something we really, uh, what we want to have for cheap as a social price, and nobody wants to work under these conditions. And when it comes to the natural resources, I live now for many years in Belgium, and in the Belgium French-speaking radio, you have once a year always an announcement in the news which is, now at this date of today, we have consumed the natural resources for the year. When I arrived in Brussels in 2006, it was in November of the year. Now it is by the end of August. Yeah? And this is not something of a crystal ball, it's a reality. So therefore this question, which is another debate than the social pillar, but how we combine this with the sustainable development also on this, I think this is another debate that we have also where the social democrats can have ownership. Yes. Uh, Monica, yes, very, very briefly. I, I can't stop myself. I must, if you are rich and I'm poor, what really matters for my income is what you do with your money that will define if it's sustainable or not. If you will use it for buying a big car which is consuming uh, the air, I breathe, then it's bad. But if you are investing it and in a production that gives me a good job with uh, some decent salary, then it's a good investment and it will be a, a sustainable way of using your money. So it's not really... Uh, uh, the issue of income inequality, it, it's not really an issue of what's wrong, what, uh, is it right or wrong, that's a political decision. What's uh, more interesting, one might add, in an economic sustainability, that would be what you do with your money. Is it effective? On, on the sustainable, it, it will be a topic, I think, for, for coming conferences as well. I know that next time that Europe Together is meeting, it will be on a, on a, indeed on a conference on how to build sustainable cities in Antwerp already, I think, uh, next week. So these are issues that we will be discussing in the, in the family as well and in the framework of this project. I think I will actually ask you to just stay along the stage so that we save time now and I ask uh, Udo Bullmann to come on stage to present uh, the, the statement please um, Vice President of the SD Group um, you have been in charge of working with the declaration of tonight, we've had some input over social media, we'll have some input from the, the discussion what is your take and how will it change the declaration, please. Thanks very much uh, first of all dear friends at the end of this wonderful evening I may tell you that it is still more than 1,000 people watching us online. This is what the media team just told us. And it is a matter of fact that in Sweden on Twitter we are number one. Number two is social summit of tomorrow, but number one is together of tonight. So thanks to all well done. participants, all our visitors, all our guests, and especially to the preparatory teams, to all the helping hands that were involved in organizing uh, this successful evening uh, tonight here in Gothenburg. Pardon? Go on, please, yes. No, the, the idea is that uh, given this huge success, I slimmed down my uh, resume from the foreseen 60 minutes to I uh, slim it down to, to, to only focusing on the, on the main points because history shows that we should not overdo when it is also necessary to strengthen ourselves by celebrating such successes. So this is what all the involved people um, I think uh, will expect from me now. But, now comes the but. Let us go back to the challenge which we started off. Our young ambassadors, thanks to you, you enriched our conference enormously, had some critical words on us. Kim Yan especially, very bluntly told us, the policy makers, it was addressed to us, also to us, the Social Democrats, please, don't get bought off by big money. Please, don't be only a victim of the rich and influential. Don't be puppets in history. Explain to us, show us that you can do something, that you can change and organize a better life 
for everybody. So this was the very question overshadowing all of our discussions tonight. I can't do any better than repeating the answer of Georgi Pirinsky. He explained to us, yes, indeed, he explained to us, it's us together who can do that. There is no book of history determining the final outcome. There is no book of history of the European Union. There is no guarantee that we are successful. No, it's either us or it will not be done. As a famous uh, thinker of the socialist movement has described, no, people do not make history without preconditions, but they are doing, I translated from German into English, but they are doing that themselves. So it's upon us all responsibility is on us. And whenever I come to this together, these marvelous together events, seeing people coming together from Portugal, from Spain, from France, from Sweden, from Finland, from all over the European places, from Germany of course, I get some feelings that it's possible that we can do that. Because this is our way to overcome boundaries to overcome restrictions and to also overcome within our family the selectiveness of our discourses, the selectiveness, the nationalistic uh, attitude of how we see things and to develop a more homogeneous, a more understanding approach of what other people think and what other people have kind of worries. And this is what we have to do. Yes, indeed, if we do it like that, if we put it like that, and it was already said on, on stage, then the social summit of Gothenburg with its proclamation of tomorrow is not the apex on the discussion on a social agenda, but rather the starting point. Yes, we can deliver, but yes, we have to take them responsible. And we are the ones that have to read out to the citizens and to our workers, to those who feel in their daily lives how far we got with social Europe and what still has to be done. We are the ones that must not declare mission is already accomplished. No, we have to declare that we have to take it on and that we have to be very, very clear about the tasks ahead. We know exactly that there is a lot of things to be taken on to build a truly social Europe. Let me give you some examples. We will never accept... Very short, uh, Udo. We will never accept... I'm in Sweden. And this is one of the reasons I would like to focus on that. Let me pick out only one item of the whole range of issues that we have discussed. Because Marita always reminded us it's about trade unions, the socialist family, the progressives, but also about the trade unions. We will never accept that social rights, such as the right to strike, can be trumped by economic so-called freedoms. If a strike called by democratic and representative unions is declared illegal because some court holds that business rights to make profit is more important, something is wrong in Europe. This was the Laval case, you will remember that very well, and we will never give in to practices like that, and this is one of the major reasons why we need dearly a social protocol to be annexed to the treaties. Such a protocol would make it clear once and for all that fundamental social rights take precedence over so-called economic freedoms. This is our fight. This is our fight together with our friends from the trade union family, and this is our fight in the socialist and progressive family. Now have some fun together. Informal exchanges are welcome. And we meet all of us again in the next Together event. Work has to be continued. Let's be successful and let's stick together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Udo. I, I, I have been... I have been asked to ask
all, uh, all of you to come up on stage for our family photos. I take this opportunity to say goodbye to everyone who has followed us online. Great that you have been so numerous. Great that you have also made a lot of input on Twitter while following us. Please remember that this is a journey. This was just one stop on the journey. The journey continues. We want as many people as possible to follow us critically with input, with insights, with perspectives, with indeed proposals and, 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 and amendments to the documents that are, that, are, um, that are produced. We also want more people to join us as ambassadors, so don't hesitate uh, to, to do that. Thank you so much for joining us. For those of you who are privileged to be here tonight and are not part of the speakers, not joining for the family photo, the reception's open, so please enjoy yourself, have something to drink and some snack, and we'll continue the discussion informally. Thank you so much. <laughs>